Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm following on, obviously, from Karen and Francis, um, talking a bit more about minerals and, and really, you know, where the urgency that we might need them and also where possible supplies of them. I think most people in the room will know this is a very emotive subject. And I think um, even just in the UK Parliament last week, there was a motion to put a moratorium on massive sulphide mining by the UK and to, to say that they wouldn't take any licences. So it's a very emotive subject. But really what I want to just give you is an overview of what's there, where we are, and what we would still need to do if we ever decided we were going to do this. So essentially, to kind of go over it, um, we know, and I think Karen and I think Francis did exactly um, a really good summary of we've got a real global demand for metals and minerals, and it's on the rise. And the reason for that is the global population is rising, and the global population is also looking for their smartphones, they're looking for their iPads, and a lot in developing countries now, mobile phones are key to healthcare and key to lots of things. So it's a rise, this technology is going to grow, and we can't turn around and say, well, sorry, we're not going to supply this anymore because people are depending on it. So we've got to take that into consideration. And also, talking about decarbonisation, that actually the green economy is growing. And the green economy, and it's something that we don't always talk about, obviously needs a lot of metals. And, and how do we, you know, we balance that up? What do we do? So we do have supply from existing mines. Um, and we've talked a wee bit in the questions and Cam talked about the recycling. But also I think what was shown in the other talks is recycling can only satisfy some of the demand. And even if we, re we could recycle everything to 100%, there'd still be a gap. We would still need more supplies. And essentially, you know, as demand la uh, rises, so does the cost, and we'll look for new markets and new sources for these supplies. So the other thing which is probably quite a kind of um, emotive comment is that de deep sea mining can offer social and environmental advantages for mineral development. And you would think, well, actually, hold on a minute. Most of the things for deep sea mining is that it's going to cause a lot of environmental damage, and we're worried about that. But to be quite frank, if you saw some of the online mining, I mean, we talked, um, Francis talked about China and some of the environmental. But if you go to, for instance, the Southern Hemisphere and see a lot of the mining, and they're, they're well-run mines by well-known companies. But essentially in the South Pacific, certainly Papua New Guinea, um, they are discharging their mining waste into the deep ocean. So there is, you know, there's, there's, there's environmental impacts happening with online uh, land mining and also social impacts as well, big social impacts in the southern hemisphere to get these metals that we need. So we have to take that into consideration as well. And then there's requirement for obviously in-depth understanding of the environmental impact of deep sea mining. And what if we did decide to go ahead with this, what would we need to manage it? And what could we do to minimise the impact or even mitigate it where possible? And obviously where we try to we work to is this precautionary approach. So just to kind of give you a summary of deep sea mineral resources, there's three main types of actually actively forming mineral deposits. Seafloor massive sulphides. Now these are the ones that produce for us copper. You know, it's got high concentrations of copper, zinc, lead, silver and gold. And a lot of people would say, well, do we really need more gold? But copper, we need copper. Um, we need copper for lots of things, and electric cars are one of them. So copper is one of the things we do need. And then we've got manganese nodules and cobalt-rich ferromanganese crusts. And both of these are actually producing what <coughs> Francis explained and at Karen, these critical metals. So looking at cobalt looking at, at some of the other critical metals that are enriched in these manganese and iron, take them out of solution and they enrich them. And you can see here that um, the C4 massive sulphides, they tend to form on or below the seabed um, at volcanically active plate boundaries. And one of the things with the massive sulphides is we can see what's on the surface and we could map that, but we can at the moment, we've got no way of uh, understanding what's below. So we don't know the amount of the resource. With manganese nodules, 95% of them are in the sediment and about 5% sit on the surface of the sediment. So you can imagine how you're going to have to mine them, big scoop. 
to get these up. Um, and then you've got the, seam, the ferromanganese crusts, which precipitate on seamounts. Anywhere where there's rock without sediment at seamounts, you'll, you'll start to get these crusts. And really, th the thing to look at here is, you know, manganese nodules, 1 to 10 millimetres per million years growth. And then you've got the similar here, 1 to 5 millimetres per million years for the crust. So they're not rapidly forming. So we have to understand what the resource is. We have to understand what we're going to do with it and how, if there's such a thing, we could recover that somewhat sustainably. So this is a, a map of the main distribution of mineral resources. And you can see here the red. These are where you get these massive sulphides. So it's the people, when people talk about hydrothermal vents, hydrothermal vents, you tend to get massive sulphides created round about these hydrothermal vents. And then you see here the polymetallic nodules, where they are. And then we've got in blue the ferromanganese crusts. Um, so C4 massive sulphides occur in water depths of up to about 5,000 metres, but typically they're in, you know, about 2,000 metres, 2,500 metres, and Swara well, 1 in Papua New Guinea is 1,500 metres. You've got polymetallic nodules. The highest concentrations of them are found about between 4,000 and 6,000, and the one that people will be, if you have heard about them, will be the Clariton Clipperton Zone, and the UK are sponsoring two manganese nodule licenses in that area at the moment. So the UK have two licenses there, or sponsoring two licenses. And then you've got the ferromanganese crusts, which are found at 400 to 4,000 metres, but the richest in cobalt are between about 800 and 2,500 metres. So I think you can see there from the depth that these um, resources are in, that technology to actually recover these is not going to be easy. It's going to be quite difficult. So looking at the deep sea resource potential, we need to look at where are the areas that we can actually mine, what's the size of potential resource, and, and as Karen, uh, Francis showed really clearly with the rare earths, we need to understand the geochemical compositions to see that we're actually getting what it is that we're, we want or we need. So if we look at um, globally, uh, for the seafloor massive sulphides, there's 3.2 million square kilometres. For manganese nodules, the permissive area is greater than 51 million square kilometres. And cobalt rich crust about 23 million square kilometres. So that's kind of areas where the resource has been assessed to be in that area, and that's where you could mine. So the location is now for manganese sulphide, uh, manganese sulphides, uh, not manganese, sorry, C4 massive sulphides. There's 42% in the economic zones. So this zone of 200 miles in a country's, you know, you've got 200 nautical miles and that's called the economic zone of that country. So they're sitting in and are governed by the individual countries. So you can see from the massive sulphides, 42% are in the economic zones of different countries and about 38% are in what we would call the high seas. So essentially it's areas that's not owned by any one person, any one country. Manganese nodules are quite different. There's 19% in economic zones. So the majority, 80%, is sitting out in the high seas. And essentially, people can apply for licenses to go anywhere to, to actually mine these. And then if we <coughs> compare that to the cobalt-rich crusts, we've got 54% in the economic zones of countries. So about 40% sitting, again, in the high seas. And that, that's quite important when you start to look at where you can mine. So this, this, this map shows you really where the licensing is happening. Now, in the, the economic zone, it's up to the country to, to permit the licenses. So whatever country owns that, they permit the licenses and they have their own rules and their own regulation, how ex, um, exploration can take place or exploitation. And it's up to these countries to set those rules. However, when you get to what's called the high seas, it's the International Seabed Authority on behalf of us all, on behalf of mankind, that actually license areas and countries can bid to get a license. Now, they have to undergo certain conditions. There's a lot of conditions they have to undergo. I'm not going to go through them here because you could take a long time doing that to, to be issued with an exploration license. Now, there's nobody yet that has been given a, um, an exploitation license because the regulations are still in draft form. It's hoping by 2020 that the regulations will be finalised 
and then actually exploitation, i.e. going and taking the resource from the seabed, could go ahead at that point. So that's, that's the kind of difference um, between the economic zone and obviously the high seas. Let's go back to that. And this is up here is where the UK are sponsoring two of the manganese nodule licenses. And this is just to give you an idea of other countries, essentially where they've got licenses at the moment. And these are exploration licenses, not exploitation. So in the economic zone, what's the status? Well, there's been two mining licenses. In fact, there's three now because there's been an, another one in Papua New Guinea, two. Uh, so Sawara 1 and Sawara 2 um, have been, licenses have been given by Papua New Guinea. And Sawara 1 is probably the closest to mining. They've got all the equipment now. Well, they've got all the mining equipment They've, that was built in the UK and it's now been shipped to Papua New Guinea. However, investment's a big, big issue with deep sea mining, you can imagine it's very, very expensive. <laughs> it's risky. So investors have to, to balance the risk with the return. And at the moment, I would say that, that, that Sawara 1 is maybe not on hold, but certainly there's a question mark over it. And then you've got Atlantis Too Deep and the Sudan and Saudi Arabia is the, there. So that's the areas that get mining licenses at the moment. And then countries with act, active exploration are Japan, Papua New Guinea, Norway, and Brazil. And then we've got the Southwest Pacific nations, which are looking at this and have been working for the last 10, 15 years to see what they can do. And for example, here's the Cook Islands and manganese nodules, and they're actively at the moment trying to find out how they can actually develop this industry. The other thing to say is it's not always pub publicised when it's in an ecozoic zone. And one of the reasons for this is they're waiting to see what the ISA regulations come out. Everybody's watching to see what these exploration ISA licenses will be, because they'll affect how the industry goes forward. Um, so why the deep sea? Well, basically, as we said before, the, the, the kind of demand of what we need as we develop. And, and remember, as, as the world develops, we're depending more on robotics, etc. So we're going to need these metals. And so the commodity price increases and that drives innovations in science and technology of how to recover these resources for wherever they may be in land or sea. So this will unlock new mineral resources. Um, and essentially, the deep ocean is one frontier that could contribute to future mineral supply. As I said at the beginning, it's still a very emotive subject and there's still a lot of things that we have to... There's a lot of science still to go behind that before we can start to give definitive answers. Um, critical metals, we've, we've heard about these. Um, they've got high economic importance and are at risk of supply disruption. If you saw, I think Francis gave a very good um, summary of where the rare earths are and with China controlling demand. So there are other elements that are in a similar situation. And I think the UK especially wants to make sure that it actually can have a supply of the metals that it needs. So again, deep sea mineral deposits have higher concentrations of these, some of these critical metals, and they're particularly those important to the decarbonisation technologies. And that's talking about, um, obviously, electric cars, solar panels, all of these things we have to think about. So principal drivers for getting more minerals, decarbonisation, resource efficiency, um, the green economy, where we need more metals, technology, security of land-based metal supply, um, and also, we're talking about getting higher grades. The seabed minerals are of higher grades of the certain metals that, that we're wanting to recover. And also, we have to remember, as I said at the beginning, we have resource-poor but high-use countries uh, as well. And we might be considered one of those, because for these metals, we are resource-poor, but we are high-use. high, high use. And, and I have to say that, obviously, the UK, I mean, this is not new to the UK. They've been working on it for a number of years now. And Andrew, who's part of the and sitting in the audience, has been working not only for the UK, but also in the EU reports for looking at critical metals. And obviously, the US Department are looking at it as well. So there's been a lot of work done in this. And it seems, from what I can see, that different countries have different prominence on different metals. So the US have, have, I think, a larger list of what they call critical metals. So there is a lot of work going on there so that we can determine, essentially, security of supply, but also what resources we need. And really, 
it was just to, to go over again the idea of minerals and metals for a green and blue economy. I think both um, Karen and Francis went through this. But essentially, we're talking about, obviously, light bulbs. We're talking about solar energy. We're talking about tidal and marine energy and barrages. We're talking about wind. And just as an example, if you look at um, a wind turbine, <coughs> it needs 500 kilograms of nickel, 1,000 kilograms of copper, and it takes 12 times more copper to create one kilowatt than conventional power generation. So it's green, but... There's somewhere else where we're needing to actually use power and we're having to get resources to, to create these, to get this green energy. And if you look at the electric vehicle, it contains over twice the copper content of the average car. It's got two kilometres of copper wiring. We need nickel and copper is essential for the hybrid cars. And then when we talk about completely electric cars, we're talking about lithium and cobalt and the batteries in these. So, yes, we want to decarbonise. Yes, we want to move... And, and take these technologies that will help us, but we have to remember that there is an energy cost somewhere else. So what's the challenge? Um, and there's a bit of a conundrum here. So future development depends on technology, and we all know that, and we can see it happening. It needs metals, so we're talking about renewable energy, we're talking about robotics, we're talking about all the different things that we need. So the metals are required to promote and increase decarbonisation of energy. However, and I think... Again, Francis pointed this out, metal production is carbon intensive. So we need these metals, but the production is carbon intensive. And really, you know, as a consequence of growth in the population and material demand, we've got a strong co correlation with um, human-induced environmental change. And I think we've already touched on that at the conference. Um, so material demand is pushing us towards environmental limits of our planet. Um, and we want a more sustainable future. And I think what we want, we want a more, a more sustainable future will include more from less. So we talked about reuse and remanufacture and recycling, although that can't fill the gap. As well as we have to think about low carbon extraction and processing of metals from land or bodies. So that's got to be one of the drivers. But also, we need to think about... And that, a well-regulated low-carbon extraction from high-grade ore bodies in the deep ocean. And the question there is, is that going to help us or not? I don't know the answer to that. I don't think we do know the answer yet. We can start to postulate whether it will, but we don't have all the facts yet. And this is just to give you an idea. So essentially, this is um, metal production and energy consumption. And essentially, this, this is just showing you for the various industries... Where, what kind of energy that they're using. And you can see here, mining's in the energy, in energy intensive industries, and we know that. So it's using, to, create, to get these metals from land, we're using a lot of energy. Not only that, we've got de declining ore grades. So technology has allowed us to actually mine lower and lower grades of ore, uh, which is financially vi viable. They wouldn't have been in days gone by, but they are now because of the markets and the demand. So essentially, we're having to use huge <coughs> amounts more energy to get the same amount of metal from it because we're using these lower <coughs> ores. And also, what we're doing is we're actually going deeper and deeper to get some of these ores, and there's more material on the top. And again, we have to use energy to remove that, what's called overburden, to get at what we want, the ore we want to process. So it all adds up to that we're using more energy to get these metals. So if we take an example of the seafloor massive sulphide, essentially, and now these where you would look at this as, one, I would say copper, because they're high in copper. So if we start looking at the areas where we need to have copper, so they're enriched in copper. And we can see here, down here, what we're um, comparing here is massive sulphide, so on the seafloor, compared to volcanic massive sulphides, which are land-based. And you can see here, copper, essentially in the four, is round about between 7 and 8%, compared to 0.5% on land-based. If you look at the zinc, it's the opposite. So here we're looking at, you know, about 0.4 to 4%, but we're getting about 8, 7, 7.5% 7 on that land deposit. They're not all the same. And again, gold is high. So you can see gold here, and three of them is a lot higher than the land. And then silver, again, it's the opposite. So if we look at 
basically the copper and the gold. It's higher, much higher concentrations, so you're going to have to mine less to get the same amount of metal. <coughs> and also, it's main, well, at the moment, it's at the surface. They're talking about mining basically what's in the surface, maybe one to two metres down. That might change once we can actually, from a geologist's point of view, assess the resource properly and what's underneath that seabed. But at the moment, it's sitting near the surface. So essentially, you're going to lose, use less energy to get that, to get at it. But again, you've got to get it to the surface, to the boat. So again, you're going to start using more energy. So there is, I mean, at the moment, what we're saying is higher ore grades, less rock has to be processed to produce the same amount of metal. Um, so that's one point, and we could do it. And, and that's where Soara One and Papua New Guinea, I mean, as I say, it's quite close to going ahead now. And they're, they're go they might be mining this year or beginning of next year. But the other area to look at is um, low carbon metal extraction from the crusts and nodules. So I showed in this, the, one of the slides there that mining is, is very energy intensive and one of the things we have to do is get that decarbonised. We need to get it low energy. And what BGS is doing at the moment, and this is Paul Lusty, um, is part of the marine ETEC uh, work that he's working on, looking at ferromanganese crusts from tropic seamounts in the North Atlantic. And basically what they're looking at at the moment is how can we mine, how can they actually mine these? But they're looking at how they're formed. We need to understand how they're formed. You know, is it microorganisms that's mainly causing these things to form? And then actually how much is there? Can we actually assess the whole of the resource that's there? But what manganese nodules and manganese crusts, the difference for the with these is that you can actually extract the metals and dissolve them by weak acid leaches. So there is possibility of low energy chemical and biochemical methods to actually extract and concentrate these metals. So they might be a route to lower energy metals. Also, we're studying the microorganism that lives in these ferromanganese crusts because what we're finding or what we're looking into is, are they selectively concentrating metals. Now, in the 1980, late 1980s, I think it was a Dundee, a scientist from Dundee University found out a microorganism could concentrate uranium 10,000 times its own weight, and uranium microorganisms could concentrate up. We think there's a possibility that some of these microorganisms might be doing exactly the same thing. So again, this would be a low energy way to get some of these metals. Also, to think about the manganese crusts, is, uh, they assessed, we don't know if it, it's not accurate, but the assessed um, resource is 50 million tonnes of cobalt from manganese crusts in the Pacific. The total land reserve, assessed reserve for cobalt is 7 million tonnes. So you can see the difference there, that there's a huge resource there. So we have to understand how we can get access to it. Can we do it environmentally responsibly? Can we low energy extract these metals? So that, that's some of the key areas that we're looking at at the moment. So should we mine the deep sea? Well, there's no definitive answer and there's many challenges to overcome. Uh, current estimates indicate that deep sea hosts large quantities of metals, sometimes exceeding land-based mineral reserves. But accurate resource assessments are unavailable due to lack of exploration. It uh, depends on mining models. I mean, obviously, the financial models and the fact of CapEx and OPEX and, and everything else that goes there, it's not a cheap thing to do. And it's not a short-term solution. I mean, deep sea mining has been talked about for the last, what, 40 years. And really, in the last 20 years, they've been actively doing something. We still haven't mined anything. So... It's not a short-term solution. Likely the mining of some scale will happen in the next 10 years, and science can assist in the assessment of impact and development. I must be getting near the end of my time. So I'm going to say environmental is key to all of this. We need to understand if we're going to mine, how we're going to manage this. This is a diagram showing it's um, massive sulphides, but you could change this for manganese nodules. It would be slightly different in how you'd be getting it up and how you would mine it, but it's a similar thing. And essentially, we have to manage. You were talking about lighting, noise, <coughs> discharge here. What if this pipe burst? 
and you're returning all the fines and the dewatered material. What happens down here with all these plumes that you're, you're, you're um, creating? They've got metals in them. That's why you're mining and doing various things. These will, will move and go to other areas. So we have to understand that. And I suppose the most fundamental thing is we don't know enough about the deep sea environment at the moment to understand how the, what impacts we're going to cause. It has happened. I said, well, will we mine? The Japanese last year, the end of last year, did actually go down and do pilot mining, and they have brought ore to the surface. And this is just the last two slides. is Main science questions. What are the environmental impacts of deep sea mining? Can we accurately assess the available resource? Is the carbon footprint lower for metal production of seabed minerals in comparison to land base? I don't know. I might be, I just don't know. Somebody's done that, but I don't think they have. Can we develop low carbon extraction of metals from deep sea mineral resources that are financially and environmentally viable? And can advances in technology allow us to minimise or mitigate environmental impacts of deep sea mining? And these are the main barriers to development. And I think the main ones is we don't, we haven't acted you know, accurately understand the resources. We've got limited knowledge of the impacts. We have to develop new exploration tools and financial capex and opex and investments, a big one. You need to de-risk it for investors and then social public perception. And then essentially implications, we've got the ISA regulations. And the good thing about that at the moment is the general secretary of the ISA is from the UK and the UK are driving these. And to be quite frank, that's a plus because the UK have got high standards for these so that's a good thing and the investment and finally just to say the UK was first discovered nodules are way back in 1872 so it was a long time ago thank you you got yeah, we got time for questions so any questions on the deep sea the deep deep blue sea yes Thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, first, a comment. Uh, you didn't say much about the, um, the spreading reaching in deep sea vents in, in terms of the biology and the connection between geology and geology, which probably is the most vulnerable uh, issue in that respect. And then my question is, uh, I just realized that the estimates, at least the Norwegian ones that I've mm. been seeing, are extremely different from the different environments. Is there one... A kind of, of, you know, way to estimate this because the uncertainty seems to be enormous. You're absolutely right. The uncertainty is large. We are trying, and there's new techniques at the moment for mapping um, to, to try and understand this resource. We're using a lot more AUVs, but also we're using electric magnetic um, combined with seismic to try and understand it a bit better. But I think, to be honest, it's because lots of it's been unexplored. So, you know, we're taking a small bit that we've explored and we're, you know, extrapolating. Andrew, do you want to say something? No? I was just going to comment about the link between the, bio yeah. sorry, the, link between the biology and the hydrothermal vents for the seabed massive yeah. sulfides. It's really important to say the only seabed massive sulfides that have been considered for mining are inactive ones. So there's no, bi there's no, there's not, you don't get the biological diversity that you get on the active vents. You don't, but there is a, there is just recently uh, kind of knew that they're looking at inactive vents because they, they reckon that they're now supporting a different community. But it's not the same. You're absolutely right as those events. Uh, you're, you're right about the biology, and, and that's why I said we still don't understand it. We're doing a lot about it. I chair the, the Gazamp working group looking at deep sea mining and, and other discharges for mining. And, and yes, you're right. We've got a huge amount to learn. But there's a lot of good work going on. Can I ask to, to follow up there? I mean, isn't it the case? Is it the case that the regulations is likely to prohibit destruction of active biota, but they might allow it in, you know? Yeah. The, the, the challenge with the inactive ones, to be honest, is finding them hmm. because we, we don't. One of the things we don't understand about them is what their fate is because they 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 disappear and we don't know why. Okay, well, yeah, <laughs> Louis. <laughs> In fact, we know why. They oxidize. Yeah. Yeah. Most, uh, act, uh, most deposits are form forming <laughs> below surface, as you know. <coughs> they are actually, and the old ones also. Mm. Yeah. They are not at the seabed, but yeah. below surface. 
and that that's one of the things we need to understand to get an accurate of you know, an accurate estimation of the resource that's there. Uh, one more question from the floor. Oh, okay. We'll, we'll thank, thank you very you. much again, Tracy. You're very welcome. Thank you.